on this special Thanksgiving edition of Independent Sources, Indigenous Appeal, teaching children and adults the whole story about Native Americans beyond the Thanksgiving story. It's one of the most significant stories that is mistold, and so yes, the resistance is huge. And Thousand Turkey Drive, the effort to help the growing number of the city's hungry during the holiday season. This past October, last month, was our busiest month on record. In the uh, 35 years that we've been serving hungry New Yorkers, we have never seen this level of, the, of need. Those stories and more coming up on Independent Sources. Welcome to Independent Sources, bringing you news from New York's ethnic and immigrant communities. I'm Abby Ashola. Indigenous people often appear in the school curriculum around this time of year. It's usually to mark their role in the well-known Thanksgiving story about the first Native Americans who sat down with the pilgrims after a bountiful harvest. What many people don't know is that November is also Native American month. There's a growing effort to educate Americans about that fact and indigenous culture in general. Debbie Reese is the editor and publisher of American Indians in Children's Literature and tribally enrolled at Nambe Pueblo in northern New Mexico. Zyphus LeBron spoke to her via Skype about the importance of teaching children in particular how to overturn stereotypes about indigenous people. Debbie Reese, thank you so much for joining us today on Independent Sources. Well, thank you for having me. So Debbie, let's, uh, let's just talk a little bit about Thanksgiving and what you're trying to do with your blog. American Indians in children's literature. How important it is, do you think, for for children to kind of get a sense of what really happened in Thanksgiving rather than that kind of whitewash which has kind of been, you know, historically been presented to, to children in, in the United States? I think that this, um, this country that we all live in where a guiding phrase is, we the people, kind of says, we the people, but not you people. You can be in our story and we'll tell you how to be in that story. That's not justice, that's not education, that's not equity or fair to anyone. It's miseducation, it's misrepresentation. And so I think the story ought to be told as correctly, as accurately as we can do it. In your blog, you mention a number of different stories. And one of the things that spoke out to me was the fact that you know, in telling the story, it said that the the, the Native American who assisted the pilgrims um, was seen as a, a sort of, he was a, a, an assistant to them, but at the end, he's sent off to, to slavery in, in Spain. Are you trying to kind of, you know, highlight those sorts of things with, with the work that you're doing, those sorts of inequities, if you will? Sure. I think that's important that we know that Squanto was not just this wonderful man who knew how to speak English and help the pilgrims. He knew how to speak English because of a dark history in which... Europeans came here, he was um, lured onto a ship and then sent over to another country to be um, enslaved. I think that's an important part of our history and, and students ought to know that. We should know that dark side of our history. In the process of doing that, in the process of, of, of telling these stories, I mean, have you, have you encountered resistance from people who say, well, listen, you know what, it's kind of we want to tell this traditional story rather than telling this bigger story, if you will. Oh yes, absolutely. Um, people don't like anyone to poke at their dearly held stories. Thanksgiving is one of the more difficult ones to actually work with. Uh, one of my colleagues in California had death threats when she asked that the um, students in her daughter's class not reenact the Thanksgiving dinner. Um, they canceled the, um, the event, and then they had to put it back on, and CNN covered MSNBC. Um, it's one of the most significant stories that is mistold. And so, yes, the resistance is huge. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Have you encountered any yourself per uh, personally, like your, your friend you mentioned? Um, I have encountered resistance when I've spoken up about, um, in particular, mascots, because I got my graduate degree at the University of Illinois, and that ha there was an Indian mascot there. Um, when I do talks, and, and on my blog, too, uh, when I talk about anything that people hold dear, Little House on the Prairie is a good example, um, the resistance that I get is, is quite palpable. Um, I don't put the curse and uh, threatening kinds of email comments on to my blog because that, that's not saying anything. Um, but yeah, absolutely, we've been the target of a lot of that kind of resistance, my family. Mm -hmm. Do you th feel that this is sort of like a personal mission for you to spread the word about what really happened, you know, from the perspective of Native Americans at, at Thanksgiving? I was raised 
in a traditional Pueblo Indian community, and one of the teachings that we were given was that we do for others, not for ourselves. So we, so we live our life in a way that works for the entire community. That, that means not just my Pueblo community, but the state of New Mexico, the country of the U.S., the world population, um, because we all can be a better place. And uh, so I don't know that I call it a personal mission. It's just a value that I have that, I, that it, I, I'm a teacher, and teaching is what I do. Mm -hmm. You know, there seems to be a, a movement going around the, the country where it seems that indigenous people are having a greater voice. You know, there's been a call for Columbus Day to no longer be celebrated in certain areas, and in certain states it hasn't. Is this part of, is what you're doing with, you know, the, with your blog and so forth and what your friends doing, is this part of like a, a bigger movement, do you feel, of getting indigenous people to be recognized, you know, their struggles to be more recognized? I think so. I think we've seen gains in more recent years that, that we didn't have prior to uh, the last, I don't know, five or ten years. And, and I, I think social media actually is, is allowing us to make um, networks that are more productive in terms of organizing and um, pushing back on some of those those things. To, to get into some more specifics, you, you have mentioned actually several books in, in your blog that you think are, are great reads for young readers and even you know people like myself who want to learn more about Native Americans and so forth. So um, your list of, of, of reads include The People Shall Continue, that's by Simon Ortiz. Could you talk a little bit about that book? Sure. It, I, I like Simon's work in general. He's done a lot. Uh, he's read at the White House. He's, he is a, one of our most esteemed scholars and poets in American Union studies. And he's Pueblo, so you know, it's more the same general area that I'm from. Um, but the, the People Shall Continue starts with that idea that there are over 500 different tribes, and we all have different ways of dressing and speaking. All our material culture is different, and our origin stories are different because we are different. And so he starts with that. So right as soon as a teacher picks that book up and starts to use it, diversity just flows through that. It goes through um, contact when uh, the, the British and the Dutch arrived here and what that meant, and then into war and then into treaties. Um, he doesn't shy away from any of those things that are parts of American history, not just American Indian history, but American history. They ought to be part of that curriculum. So he goes through that history as dark as it is and talks about survival and that um, we all actually have to work together, um, Chicanos, African Americans, we all have to work together to fight the greed that is destroying America. And he published that book in 1977 and I think it's absolutely relevant today. The uh, the other book on your on your list, uh, Debbie, is the uh, the Jingle Dancer. Uh, tell uh, us about that one. I love Jingle Dancer. It's a book that I wish that um, I had in my hands when my daughter was dancing for the first time. It is a story about how a community or a family comes together to help a child do something in her traditional culture that she hasn't done before. In this case, the Jingle Dance. Um, how she visits people in her family to help her learn the dance and to. Um, put together her traditional dress for that dance. There's also um, a really important piece of that story is that it could be set in any neighborhood. The little girl lives in a uh, suburb with uh, pitched roofed houses and paved streets. Uh, she's wearing jeans and tennis shoes. It pushes against that idea that, you know, only Indians, um, I'm sorry, that Indians lived a long time ago and the ones that still live today wear buckskin and feathers because that's not the case. We wear our traditional clothes for certain times of the year, not every day. Um, so that's they're, they're, another reason I really like that book is one of the characters is a lawyer. My daughter's in law school and you know like you know how many ways can that book be perfect? Right, right. The other one on the list here is How I Became a Ghost by Tim Tingle. Really I, I like the cover on this book but you know never judge a book by its cover but tell us a little bit about this book. Well, that's a that's a wonderful book for many reasons as well. These are books by Native writers who know their people, know their history, know that culture, and, and they know what they want to share. Um, people like traditional Native stories because they think, you know, we're mystical, we've got all this wonderful communing with nature and all that. But there's a lot more to who we are than that. Um, our religions are part of our daily lives, and so Tim Tingle presents Choctaw religion and beliefs as part of the daily life. It's not like, ooh, shapeshifters. It's, there's a panther. And um, there's how I became a ghost. It just is. It's not, this, it's not packed with all of that new agey kind of stuff that you see in way too many children's books. Right. And finally, the, the, on the list is We All Count. And this one is by Julie Flett, I believe. Tell us about right. that one. 
Julie Flett is um, First Nations. She's um, Cree, Métis, um, Canada. And her book makes a beautiful point that in spite of government efforts to kill the Indian and save the man and get rid of our indigenous languages, they persist. Um, and her book is a bilingual text. So it has English in it and, and Cree. So it's a counting book for the very young that makes the point, too, that we are still here and we still speak our languages. Now, can these books be found? Where can these books be found? Can they be found on Amazon and your local bookstore? Sure. Amazon, um, People Shall Continue is out of print, so you have to get that one um, from a used bookseller. But they are all on, on, they're easily available. And is there a push uh, by yourself and others to really try to get these books to be part of a sort of a curriculum that can be used in schools or around the country? Yes, there are um, various efforts around the country where, where the um, curriculum is being designed to include those books. Um, there's a couple of teacher reference books also that are um, um, out that can help teachers do that. All of these are in kind of information is at my website, so I kind of I could go on and on. But <laughs> absolutely, and that website uh, for the audience is. American Indians in Children's Literature. All right, all right. Well, Debbie, thank you so very much for your time today, and um, uh, best of luck. Thank you. All right, take care. Bye. Still to come on the show, a thousand turkey drive for the hungry. Before that, Crystal Lowe has some other news. Thanks, Abby. Here's a look at some headlines from New York's ethnic and community media. Queens Democratic City Councilman Rory Lansman plans to introduce a package of bills that aims to criminalize and regulate the use of chokeholds by NYPD officers. Lansman's interest in the use of excessive force by NYPD officers was largely triggered by the July 17th chokehold death of Staten Island resident Eric Garner. Although the chokehold is prohibited by NYPD departmental policy, there's no law that makes it illegal. Lansman hopes to change that, and one bill Lansman calls for the prosecution of negligent assault cases that involve inappropriate uses of force. In another bill, he requires the police department to produce annual reports on incidents where officers use force. Lansman's bill will face a long uphill battle. According to the Amsterdam News, Police Commissioner William Bratton has already publicly stated that he will not support a law that calls for a ban on chokeholds. The commissioner believes that there are already protocols put in place to address the problem. The Phil Am reports that the attendance at the Chapel of San Lorenzo is minimal compared to the population it represents. The chapel is a Catholic church in midtown Manhattan dedicated to Filipinos. They are the fourth largest Asian group in the New York metro area and number more than 13,000 in Manhattan alone. Reverend Dr. Joseph G. Maribel, the chapel's priest, says the staggering attendance may be due to the church's location. Maribel says that the church is located in an area with barely any Filipinos. An unnamed church member said that the lack of Filipinos in the area may not be the only problem. He explained that the parking is also expensive in the area, so it makes the church harder to access. He also thought that the decreased attendance may be due to the internal struggle among different church members and the priests from the Archdiocese of New York. This is happening at a time when nearly a third of the city's Catholic churches are merging or closing due to church cutbacks. La Plaza de las Americas in Washington Heights is set to receive a $3 million renovation starting in December. The market is located on 175th Street between Broadway and Wadsworth and is part of the Department of Transportation's Plaza program that ensures neighborhoods in New York have outdoor centers. The Uptowner reports that the 20-year-old market's facelift will include the addition of trees, seating, tables, a fountain, and a public restroom. Market administrators and vendors are excited about the renovations and hope that it will bring more customers to the plaza. The plaza has seen a decline in sales with the influx of chain stores that have come to the community in the past two decades. La Plaza is scheduled to open in 2015. And finally, cheese manufacturer Lawrence Rosenbaum has come up with a kosher way of fostering interfaith relations between Jews and Muslims. Rosenbaum's idea for a Cheese for Peace project led him to team up with Palestinian food scientist Rayad Mahmoud to manufacture three types of kosher halal Mediterranean cheese. Rosenbaum came up with the project after wanting to produce gourmet feta cheese that his wife insisted be kosher. He not only wanted to satisfy his wife, but he also wanted to promote an interfaith project that would be commercially successful. Rosenbaum launched the project at a recent meeting of the Foundation for Ethnic Understanding in Rockaway, New Jersey. That's from Voices of New York. Those were just a few headlines from the city's ethnic and community media. Independent sources will be right back. Thanks for staying tuned to our special Thanksgiving edition of Independent Sources. The holiday season is traditionally a time to get together and celebrate with family and food. 
Unfortunately, hunger is still a problem for many people in New York City. Statistics from the New York Coalition Against Hunger show that nearly one and a half million New Yorkers are food insecure. That means they don't know where their next meal is coming from. Food pantries like the West Side Campaign Against Hunger are trying to answer the call to address this worsening situation. Sarah Pizan sat yes, down with Hannah Lupian, the policy director at the West Side thing. Campaign Against Hunger. So they talked about what the pantry is doing to help those in need for the holidays and year-round. Hannah, thanks for joining us. Thank you so much for having me. So your organization is the first to implement supermarket-style food pantry in the city. Can you tell us a little bit about how that works and how the idea came about? Sure. We're the first supermarket-style pantry in the nation, not just New York City. Mm -hmm. We transitioned to that model in 1993 mm -hmm. after seeing the way that some of the CSAs, or Community Supported Agriculture Systems, worked on the Upper West Side. Folks could come in and pick out the produce that they wanted that week and take it with them back to their families. And our previous executive director said to herself, why couldn't we do this? Mm -hmm. why, why should lo low-income people be treated really any differently from the, the people on the Upper West Side who are subscribing to CSAs? Mm -hmm. So now families can come in, they pick out the foods that are right for their families, their cultural or religious dietary needs, or just their preferences, mm -hmm. and they can take that food back to their families. Are there requirements to, to shop at the food pantry, or can anyone just come? How does it work? We serve low-income, hungry New Yorkers. It does not matter where they come from. It does not matter uh, if they have proper um, paperwork with them or not. We're just here to serve the people that need our help. And who, and who shops at the food pantry? What have you seen? So the majority of our customers come from Upper Manhattan and the South Bronx. We're in Upper Manhattan, so that makes a lot of sense. Uh, we see an increasing number of senior citizens. It's uh, almost a third of the population that we, we serve. Um, there's always a large number of working families. So families who have jobs and are working hard, but minimum wage or their low uh, wage work isn't enough to put food on the table. So we see a lot of people in that situation. And um, as you can imagine, we just see a lot of people who were hurt by the recession in 2008 and are still struggling to get by. Wow. And um, the holiday season is usually tough for many. Thanksgiving's coming up. What do you guys have planned for, for this year? Every year for Thanksgiving, we run a wonderful program called the Thousand Turkey Challenge. Okay. And as part of the Thousand Turkey Challenge, we, um, we work with the Thousand Turkey Challenge Interfaith Coalition, mm -hmm. which is a group of 16 local uh, synagogues, churches, schools, other institutions that want to support the work we do in providing thousands of turkeys and other holiday meals uh, to, to our constituents. So that means that we're working with everybody on the Upper West Side and around New York City to raise money and also um, raise in-kind donations of turkeys and other foods to hand out in the weeks leading up to Thanksgiving. And you said that it's been going on for how many years now? You've been this is this? our fourth year. And every single year it's gotten bigger and more exciting and more diverse. And uh, it's a lot of fun. It's a really easy way for folks to join in and, and help serve their community. That's great. And actually, given last year's uh, cut to food stamps, have you seen an mm -hmm. increase in the amount of people that come to the food pantry? Yes, we are seeing more people every month. Actually, this past October, last month, was our busiest month on record. In the uh, 35 years that we've been serving hungry New Yorkers, we have never seen this level of, the, of need. And um, part of that is that uh, food stamps, or SNAP, the Supplemental Nutrition Assistance Program, was cut last fall. Mm -hmm. And we also see lower numbers of SNAP participation in New York City this year over last year. Some people might have um, uh, gotten back on their feet to the extent that they have jobs, but those jobs, as we said, aren't always enough to put food on the table. So they're still needing to come to us for, for support. So how can people participate in the Thousand Turkey Challenge? There are so many ways to get involved. I'm glad you asked. One of the easiest and I think most exciting ways that you can get involved is you can use your smartphone and you can text TURKEY to 77948. That's a fun way to do it at your Thanksgiving dinner. You can all pull out your phones. Um, other ways, you can visit our website, which is wscah.org, or you can drop in. We're going to have open hours from now and through Thanksgiving uh, to collect donations of frozen turkeys, other Thanksgiving foods like 
fresh fruits and vegetables, sto uh, um, boxed stuffing mixes, or even other um, kind of non-traditional Thanksgiving foods. A lot of our immigrant communities mm -hmm. still want to have rice and beans on Thanksgiving Day. They still like to serve pork shoulder or maybe chicken, some other things. Uh, so anything that people can bring by or donate to us online is much, much appreciated. That's great. And is the city at all helping your organization, especially during this particular time? We always have uh, wonderful amounts of support from the city, state, and federal governments. We mm -hmm. couldn't do it without them. Mm -hmm. um, the city provides uh, year-round assistance to us. We get food through the EFAP program, the Emergency Feeding Assistance Program. Mm -hmm. And um, we're always happy. Uh, our doors are always open. Uh, Mayor de Blasio, you're always welcome, or any member of your staff or family. <laughs> That's great. What about looking forward for the Christmas season? What, yeah. what do you guys usually do for that? Christmas is a little bit different for us. A lot of our clients have uh, very strong um, uh, connections and communities in their faith institutions and so there are fewer people turning to us. Mm -hmm. There's something in particular about Thanksgiving and um, and the desire to be with your family and to serve this lovely big meal in particular that that draws people to us. But uh, come December there will still be hungry people. In January and February and March and ongoing there will be hungry people. Mm -hmm. So we really do need the support of our entire New York City community all year round. Great. Well thank you for being with us Hannah. Thank you so much for having me. When we come back putting a Latin twist on the Thanksgiving tradition. Welcome back. I'm here with Jose Galarza, the head chef and owner of Sabor Borinqueño, a restaurant and catering service in Spanish Harlem that specializes in American, Puerto Rican, Italian, and Southern cuisines. Welcome, Chef Jose. Thank you for having me. So you've created Thanksgiving dinner with a Latin twist. Tell That's us what we have here. Well, first we have the centerpiece, which is the uh, roasted turkey. Uh, we have uh, the roast pork, which is very traditional in, uh, in my culture. Well, let's go back to the turkey, because okay. I love turkey. Mm -hmm. So how are you seasoning the turkey? Is there any difference in how it's seasoned? It is different in, in a sense that there's a term that we use, pavo chung, which is actually a turkey seasoned with the roast, the suckling pig seasoning. Ah. So it has that little kick to it so that when you uh, savor it, you can uh, see the difference. Wow. And what about the pork? Is there any... The pork is something similar. The only thing is just uh, a different type of meat, and but it's, se it's seasoned similar uh, with, 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 with the same ingredients. Nice. So we have the traditional gravy, of course. That's correct. Right? And then what are these? What's in this here? This is our famous, this is our coquito, which is uh, similar to eggnog, but it's, it's actually spiked Ooh. with some uh, rum. I'm going to try that. Of course. <laughs> Wow. Ooh, yes. Spiked. Hmm. Nice. <laughs> I hope we can continue the interview. <laughs> <laughs> and what do we have here? Pasteles, which is uh, similar to tamales, the best description I could give it. Uh, it's actually uh, a, a different blends of tropical of root of vegetables that's grown in the island. Uh, it has bananas, uh, okay. plantains, hmm. yautia, uh, and also uh, a, a calabaza, which is actually like a uh, pumpkin. And what you do is you blend them. Uh, as a child, we used to grade it when okay. the machines, the puree machine didn't exist. Mm -hmm. But now we have the easy way out. And we stuff it with either, you can either stuff it with pork, you can make them with chicken, or you could just do uh, uh, stuff them with veg uh, vegetables. Wow, so you're blending all those ingredients and then stuffing. Exactly. How I mean, long does have, it take to make? It takes, even with the machine, it takes quite a couple of hours, uh, wow. depending on how many pounds and how many dozens are you making. Mm -hmm. uh, and also, we must mention that the uh, batter has to be seasoned. Ah. So there's an extra step. Yes, yeah, secret ingredient. I see. Okay, and I see some rice. Yes. What's the difference between this and traditional white rice or American well, rice? Well, this is the piece of rice. We call this arroz con gandule. Mm -hmm. uh, it's, it has the, the sofrito, which is a, a blend of uh, 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 
uh, peppers, onions, uh, uh, cilantro, mm -hmm. culantro, and the base. The, the base of that is uh, also uh, we use fresh candules. Uh, you can either to give it that taste, that tr uh, that tropical taste. The best one is either you use the frozen gondolas or you could use the fresh gondola, which is going to take a little longer to make because you have to boil them uh, for a couple of hours. Okay, so I see cranberry sauce. So you're mixing the American flavor with the Latin flavor. How are you using the cranberry sauce? The cranberry is basically is going to accompany the, the turkey mm -hmm. uh, just to give it a little more, uh, make it a little more tastier and more moist. Nice, nice. And over here, I see some more American yes, dishes. Yes, we have the, the stuffing. My favorite stuffing is actually cornbread stuffing, mm -hmm. and you know it has all of uh, all the it has that little kick, that cornbread kick. But it's it tastes like it's cornbread, but it has more flavor to it. Mm -hmm. And how are you seasoning it? Well, it has you know salt and pepper. It has a, 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 a little uh, cilantro in it. Uh, also, uh, you could use parsley to give nice. it that greeny uh, color. I definitely taste the cilantro. Mm -hmm. And. The potato side, you can't forget the potato side. That's that's the that's part of the the, the, the Latin uh, Thanksgiving. Mm -hmm. uh, it's just, uh, it has onions, peppers, uh, mayonnaise, of course. And mashed potatoes, And the mashed too. potato. Those are actually garlic mashed potatoes. Ooh, nice. And then dessert. The dessert, yes. We, we can't forget about the pumpkin pie, which is American, and the flan, which is our uh, part of our culture, the Puerto Rican culture. So how is flan made? Flan is made out of evaporated milk, uh, 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 it's made out of eggs, uh, of course the sugar, uh, and the, the, the sweet milk. And what you do is you just uh, put it on a bain-marie, uh, put it in the oven, make sure that you, when you have the pan and you put it in the oven, you have a bain-marie, which is a pan with a little water so that it won't uh, burn on the bottom. So Chef Jose, tell me a bit about your restaurant and what well, you we serve. Actually located at 2253 Third Avenue, corner of East 122nd Street in East Harlem. Uh, we've been there for three years, but we started 10 years ago in another location nearby, which we have uh, worked out of as my catering department. And what kind of things do you have on the menu? Well, we uh, the restaurant itself serves Latin food. Uh, the, you see the roast pork here, you see the pasteles and the rice and peas, and we serve other items that are consistent with our culture, as chicharrón de pollo, barbecue ribs that we cook for seven hours. Oh, wow. Seven hours? Yes. What goes into that? A lot of technique. Wow. Okay. <laughs> and tender not, uh, tenderizing. Okay. And how are you celebrating Thanksgiving with your family? Well, usually, you know, of course, we are religious, and we, spend, we, we, we thank God for everything first, and then we go and partake in our festivity with family. We, we welcome, we invite family into our homes, and we just participate. Are you cooking? I participate. I don't cook everything. I do participate, but my wife helps me. Oh, nice. Okay. So if someone wants to recreate this feast, where can they go to find recipes and tips? You can go to www.savoyburinqueño.net, which is our website. Okay. Thank you so much. You're welcome. That's our show this week. Thanks for staying tuned. On behalf of the entire Independent Sources team, I'd like to wish you and your family a happy Thanksgiving. Till next time, be independent-minded. <laughs> <laughs>